Well, very good morning. It has been a long day yesterday, long evening. We still uh, expect many colleagues uh, to find their way here back today, but it's again a long day today, so we have to start. Again, welcome uh, at the second day of uh, YAS Anniversary Conference. We will have a brief uh, report about um, the major points of discussions yesterday. Before I invite uh, Jill Yeager to come up and to give us uh, her report, I would like to give you some information about the way how all the presentations, all the information which you are listening to here, being part of, is made available for you and for the general audience. You may not know that um, the presentations here are live streamed, so with a like three second uh, delay, everybody can follow around the world the presentations on the YASA website. All the presentations from yesterday, including opening session, have been posted already through YouTube on the YASA website through the YASA conference site. So this is all available already. The sessions uh, have a rapporteurs. The rapporteurs are taking notes all discussions. We have a couple of science writers in the room helping us to put up together major conclusions. And we are aiming at producing a number of written conclusions after the, um, the conference. An overview paper. We are negotiating with um, a major journals for an overview paper with major messages. A couple of short papers which may reflect one or two sessions together. And a report you will hear this morning will be first a uh, summary of uh, the synthesis which you would like to put together after this conference. Synthesis um, and recommendations. I would like now to ask Jill Yeager. Jill Yeager is a um, member of Global Change Community with many of you for many years. She has been also connected to IASA in a couple of times uh, as deputy director in 2000, around 2000 as well, so she knows IASA, but she also knows all the subjects which were discussed here from the Global Change Community. Jill, please could you come up and give us your report. Thank you, Pavel, for the introduction. Um, People have asked me, why did you agree to do that? Summarize more than 40 presentations held in one day. Um, it's a tough task. You're going to hear a summary of what I heard yesterday, not session by session, and certainly not naming all of the speakers because that would make for a somewhat strange long list of names with odd sentences scattered between. Um, but I'm going to try and at least tell you what I heard and how I think it fits together. Um, and I have the same job again tomorrow morning and we'll see how we proceed in pulling together the story that we're telling. What I heard yesterday, first of all, was some words that came up over and over again, some key words. Cis systems, obviously, transformations, boundaries, sustainability and the challenges of sustainable development, people and natural resources. The first two of those, systems and transformations, are very closely linked. Clearly, humanity is faced by a range of challenges many of which we'll also hear about again today. Climate change, land degradation, biodiversity loss, water quality, food and water security, chemical pollution. As Ban Ki-moon said in his address to us yesterday morning, we live in an era of traumatic change. These challenges have been characterized certainly in recent years by others as well, as persistent problems of unsustainability. They are complex, ill-structured, 
involve many stakeholders, are surrounded by structural uncertainties, and are extremely hard to manage. The persistent problems tend to reappear, that's why they're persistent, when only their symptoms are treated, or when the measures that are taken are marginal, incremental, and not adequate to deal with the root causes. The persistence of the problems is due to what Jan Rotmans and others have often referred to as system failures. And we heard about those system failures yesterday. Institutional system failures, economic system failures, social system failures, and ecological system failures. Now, addressing system failures needs a systemic approach. And that's been the focus of IASA's work over the last 40 years. What's really clear from work carried out in recent years and reflected in several, many of the presentations yesterday, is that addressing system failures requires transformations. That is, the solutions will not be found by making small incremental changes to the system that we have today. We're talking about systemic changes in all of these examples. We heard yesterday about historical transformations, and we know that those kinds of transformations, like the post-1950 emergence of, say, personal mobility, intensive agriculture, fossil energy infrastructure, were partly driven by the promise of solving societal problems, such as poverty, inequality, lack of education, and so on. However, those post-1950 transformations have, as Johann Ruckström showed last night, in turn produced their own problems. Individuals might now have access to cheap energy and mobility, but the results are pollution, resource exploitation, and congestion. So the challenge that we face is to deal with these complex and persistent modern problems through finding new ways of dealing with them, in a more anticipatory and exploratory manner. And we clearly need to improve our understanding of the dynamics of these complex processes of change and try to influence their speed and their direction. The talks yesterday gave some further examples of historical transformations. Naki mentioned the emergence of the Neolithic revolution that brought agriculture and permanent settlements and the industrial revolution that's still ongoing. And it's based on our knowledge of these transitions and transformations that we see a whole set of research and policy challenges emerging. But what was clear yesterday was that business as usual is no longer an option. We also heard about transformations that have already started, such as the energy system transition, trans transformation in Denmark, discussed by Cathy Richardson, and the energy system transformation in Japan, discussed by Kenji Yamaji. We also heard about the ongoing ICT revolution, which, according to Jeffrey Sachs, is a current fundamental transformative power. The beginnings of transformations are everywhere. As Björn Stixon pointed out, the green race is on. Transformations are fundamentally about changes in the coupled human environment system. And we heard yesterday two of the other key words that I picked out about both sides of that system, the humans and the natural resources. As Wolfgang Lutz pointed out, people are the agents of change towards sustainability. Fundamental transformations also involve changes in people's demands. 
However, not all people have the same capabilities of being agents of change. So enhancing human capital through education, and as we heard yesterday, particularly through human, uh, female education, and through improved health services are an essential component of transformations towards sustainability. In addition, we need to engage people in these transformation processes. For this, as Yolanda Kakabatsi pointed out yesterday afternoon, the CSOs, civil society organizations, can play a central role, acting at a local level to bring the, make the bridge to action. And at the same time, as we saw in the presentations yesterday afternoon, people and energy end use define the future possible space for technological change. There's a codependency between people and technology. Finally, on the topic of the people side of the equation, uh, Jackie McGlade talked to us about bringing citizens and citizen science into everything that we do. They would be engaged in the monitoring of change, but by doing that also become agents of change. The other side of the, the equation, the natural resources, was a focus yesterday afternoon. We saw natural resources that have been seriously degraded by human activities and saw that this leads to the discussions about food and water security. As Nina Fedorov asked, can we double the food supply and still shrink the ecological footprint of agriculture? Her answer was that we can, but will we feed the 10 billion? How do we deal with the challenges of transboundary water management in a changing world? The question posed by David Gray, pointing to the need to move from thinking local to thinking global for water issues. And to answer these questions, it's clear that a systems approach is the only way forward. As Sabina Fuss showed us, food security is not a goal to be achieved in isolation. The interactions between natural resources and institutions and people are very complex, as we saw repeatedly yesterday. And at the same time, there are limits to the extent to which humans can exploit and degrade natural systems, something that we will hear more about during the conference. Through all of this, we heard about the contributions that technology can and must make, but with warning signals that behavioral changes are also part of the solution. As we move towards the end of the first day, there was an increasing intention given to positive sum outcomes, win-win solutions. As K1 Rihai showed, a fundamental transformation of the energy system is required if environmental, economic and social sustainability goals are to be achieved. And the recently completed global energy assessment has shown that this transformation of the energy system is technically possible and has identified the multiple benefits that it would bring. And these multiple benefits were also the, the focus of Sig Clement's presentation, showing that addressing short-lived climate forces like black carbon and tropospheric ozone and methane would not only mitigate climate change, but would also improve air quality and public health worldwide. Overall, the presentations and discussions on day one underlined the global challenges that the world faces in the second decade of the 21st century. And many of these challenges will be picked up again today and tomorrow with an increasing focus on what does this mean for the kind of research that we do. The subtitle of this conference is From Science to Policy and we'll probably have some more discussions about the appropriateness of the title.
But day one showed us what needs to be done on both sides of that, for the science side and for the policy side. We also talked about the interface between them, nicely described by Joe Alcamo as the science policy partnership. We saw the need for building trust between both sides, and we began to think that maybe it's not science and policy, but science and society. Several of the presentations showed that an important element in the transformation of human environment systems is education, which is necessary for an effective science-society partnership. If I look then at what um, messages came out for the research community yesterday, things that we need to be thinking more about, I saw four main elements, and I'm sure I'm going to add to that list during the course of today. The first one was this taking an integrated system perspective, a holistic view to deal with complexity but also to embed that holistic view within a local context. The second was a clear focus on humans as the agents of change, but also as groups within communities of practice. Third one was engaging in new and creative collaborative partnerships, including partnerships with business. And the fourth one was bridging the gap between knowledge and action, including co-design and co-production, a challenge for the research community. But at the same time, we could see uh, needs for fundamental transformations on, in human environment systems, um, pointing to the need for new policy approaches integrated policy approaches. On the policy side, we heard about the needs for adaptive systems that provide incentives, but also flexibility, in which new findings lead to concrete actions, not just to new policies, in which learning is supported and which is guided by a vision and in which bottom-up processes of transformation are guided by some top-down integrative governance framework. Several presentations suggested that the global challenges are not being met by our current international institutional responses. New, innovative solutions are needed, like the Climate Club idea presented yesterday evening by Bill Nordhaus. Listening to the, all of the presentations yesterday, I did have this great sense of urgency that's still there. Um, it was reflected in many talks. This urgency to start and continue transformational changes. But I also saw signs of optimism, indications that the knowledge that we have from 40 plus years of systems analysis will help, and a sense of excitement that was coming out that um, not a sense of desperation given the challenges that we face. And I hope that I'll have more good news for you tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs>